you guys for uh, joining me. Uh, today we have uh, with us Gabe Cervantes, who's a research manager and works with my friend Bob Johansson. And uh, he has uh, uh, come uh, to uh, the Institute for the Future from Williams uh, College and has all these uh, studied uh, the diaspora and the movement of people and is really interested uh, in uh, studying the diaspora as it has to do with uh, uh, the people in the digital world and excited to have you as part of the conversation, Gabe. And of course, as some of you know that I've had enjoyed a nine plus years uh, friendship and, and co-thinking maybe, if I could uh, be that generous. Anyway, you've impacted my thinking anyway, Bob. Uh, uh, Bob Johansson from the Institute of the Future in Silicon Valley with over 30 years of prognostication about the future. One of the best things I think you've taught me is uh, that we see in the uh, flotsam and jetsam of those things floating back to us from the future in our present time uh, and, and love that image that we can even look around today and see that. And that's why I was really excited about your, your new book, uh, Full Spectrum Thinking, and how we can apply it uh, to a leadership. And that's what we we'll want to talk to you about today. So thanks again for, for joining me. And uh, just to give everybody a little, a little peek into that, uh, full spectrum thinking is this way of seeking patterns and clarity across gradients of possibility, outside, across, beyond, or maybe even without any boxes uh, or categories, while, and I, I like this too, resisting false certainty. So that kind of freeing us up for some creative work, looking at that flotsam and jetsam, what we see being able then to uh, adapt and move into that. What I really liked about the book too was the ideas of how we could apply and use some of that in our, in our own thinking. So what I wanna know is in the last uh, month or two months, uh, the whole American culture has really moved along with the global culture into some very adaptive ways of thinking in some way We've, we've all been thrown into this uh, a spectrum thinking, whether we liked it or not, because we've been forced to figure out some new ways of thinking. And I'm wondering, as you look out there, how does all of this align and what do you see that's bubbling up that's really interesting to you? Sure. So in a period like this, in a crisis period, you know, our brains uh, are just searching for certainty and certain trying to get rid of ambiguity i mean we're our brains are just always looking for ways to protect our bodies um, and it's it's very tricky time um, so our brains are kind of forcing us to use old categories to define new situations but you're exactly right the COVID 19 and the sort of new uh, coronavirus it doesn't fit our old categories. Right. So it forces us in to more this full spectrum way of thinking. And you know what I see as a futurist is in this kind of world, it's actually easier to look 10 years ahead and work backwards than it is to stay in the present because the present is so noisy and there's so much questing yeah. for certainty that's not there. <laughs> and you know what, I, what I'm convinced of is the future will reward clarity, but punish, punish certainty. Right. So reward clarity, but punish certainty. And, and we see that tension so often um, as we see how people respond to the current crisis. They're, they're searching for, for certainty. They just want certainty, but certainty's not there. Right. Yeah, well, and you see this even you talking about any kind of crisis management, we don't really know uh, what uh, even the next couple of months is going to bring. So to try and sort that out and figure that out with de uh, definition is it will be to not be pliable enough even to do that. Right. Well, you're talking 10 years, but you know, people are looking at, oh, it'll be this way. And then they almost have a nostalgia uh, <laughs> what it yes. was like. So we're gonna have, so let's say it's May 10th, and then things will be a new normal, but what they really are saying, it's gonna be just like March 1st. 
And, and part of what I think full spectrum thinking and that kind of futurist thinking does is it's like, no, actually in two mo- weeks, one month, it's going to be closer to what it's like in 10 years. That's right. Than it was two months ago. Right. That's right. And, and we need to teach ourselves to actually live in that dilemma, live in that paradox. And um, I don't know if you've heard uh, the notion of the Stockdale paradox. Uh, Jim Collins popularized it based on a, um, a, a, a Navy admiral that was captured during the Vietnam War and held and imprisoned by the North Vietnamese for seven years. Uh, but he made it through. And he made it through by balancing in his mind that clarity about he's going to get out and that clarity and that hope with the realism that it isn't going to happen overnight and the certainty is not going to be there. And when Jim Collins interviewed Stockdale uh, for his book, Good to Great, uh, he asked Stockdale, who were the people in captivity, the people who did not make it? Who were the people that didn't make it? And Stockdale said, oh, that's easy. It was the optimists. And what he meant by that was that the optimists kept thinking it was going to be over by Christmas and then thinking it was going to be over by Easter. And then it was rolling to the point where they gave up hope. So Stockdale wasn't saying don't have hope. He was just saying it's not certainty uh, and you need to live with that tension between your hope your belief, your clarity that you're going to make it through, and the, the reality of the, the brutal nature of the situation that they were in. And we're actually in a rather brutal situation now, too, because we haven't faced up to preparing for pandemics. You know, Johns Hopkins is telling us, the university uh, is telling us, we can expect pandemic threats about every three years now. So it, it's not like this is going to be over and then we're back to the way it was. We're going to have this more perpetual dealing with pandemic crises. And we just have to figure out how to, how to not only live with it, but how to thrive in it. Right. Well, and, you know, that's an interesting piece, too, because, uh, you know, we think about uh, George Bush did some work around pandemics. Obama did mm-hmm. some work around pandemics. You've been involved. John Hopkins has been involved. Uh, epidemiologists, all these people, actually. Bill Gates. Uh, Bill Gates was very okay. clear about this five years ago. Exactly yeah. right. So, so here's uh, what's curious about it. So, how does uh, as you think about full spectrum thinking then, and as a leader who's looking into the future, we have uh, two pieces. Uh, here. One is the false sense of certainty, the kind of grabbing a hold or placing hope in a date, uh, some sense of what that might, we can imagine that would be, uh, versus understanding our hope is actually lived out in the fact that over centuries, human beings have been very adaptive creatures and actually Mm -hmm. can move through this. Right. But what humans do, the, what we have to remember is that the way they've done that is actually through the, the interpretation of signals, what you would call signals in the book. Mm-hmm. So talk a little bit about how we differentiate that kind of false certainty on the one hand with the healthy signals that pull yeah, yeah. forward. Yeah, that, that'd that be great. And I'd like to ask Gabe to jump in here because uh, Gabe's actually been, we do at the Institute, we do a public foresight essentials training. Uh, and Gabe is one of the trainers for that. So maybe, Gabe, you could just define what we mean by a signal and how we engage people in that kind of discipline. Yeah, definitely. Uh, thank you, Bob, and thank you, Andy. Um, y- you know, signals come from the very famous uh, William Gibson, quote William Gibson, a uh, famous science fiction author. Uh, and he says, the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. Mm-hmm. And what a signal is, is a present day example of that unevenly distributed future. Um, these are very specific moments. These are products. These are news stories. These are uh, data points from, from research that's been done that say, you know, today this is something that hasn't scaled, but it has the potential to scale. And if and when this thing scales, it's going to change our world dramatically. And so what we do when we do signal scanning is not trying to predict or to place bets or investments on what's going to take off, 
what we're really doing is using signals to create nuance in our forecasts, to say, here are the different options. And we need to be open to understanding what the different options are, rather than saying, this is the end goal, this is where we're going to end up. And so signals is a very healthy way for us to just be more imaginative and more creative about what our potential futures could look like. Got it. And the interesting thing about signals, uh, Gabe, is Gabe and I have learned, is that most signals fail uh, commercially. They fail, but they tend to fail in an interesting way. And that's the, that's the kind of failure we're looking for, the, the kind of mantra of Silicon Valley where Gabe and I work is fail early, fail often, fail cheaply. Right. And, you know, Andy, if I can just jump in here and, and say, you know, there are um, a great uh, kind of certain domains for when you go out for looking for signal one, where Bob and I are both ba based in Silicon Valley, and it's so easy to fall into the trap of constantly looking for tech signals. And, you know, what's the latest tech signal? And, and what's the new thing in tech? And what is someone doing with AI? You know, et cetera, et cetera. But what we found and really where our interest has started to lie is with the kids with the next gen generation what we call the true digital natives and the cross reality yeah. Natives. Yeah. the true digital natives are those kids who are 24 years of age or younger in 2020 and uh, the XR natives are roughly 13 to 15 years of age in in the year 2020 and just under define XR Gabe yeah, so XR would be cross-reality natives, right. whereas the true digital natives kind of grew up in this world of uh, true digital media, right? Around 2010, we call it the 2010 threshold. Um, the internet shifted uh, towards creating a true media ecology. Uh -huh. And so kids who grew up and who started to become uh, young adults in this, in this era and shortly after it, um, they just think differently. They operate differently. And so the forecast now is that in 2020, um, there's this new cross-reality um, reality, right? There, there's this new ability to, to immerse yourself not only in the digital world or the physical world, but truly a blending of both. Yeah, and yeah. so that would be what is what defines the cross reality uh, natives. And, you know, the reason why I personally feel we, we look to these kids is Bob talks about the importance of clarity versus certainty. And the more you talk to these kids and the more signals you see from these kids, um, certainty is no longer a thing in their world. <laughs> um, you know, you talk to the kids from Parkland, you talk to the kids who are on the front lines um, or have been on the front lines historically uh, uh, around climate justice, and they're saying there's no certainty left, right? Uh, yeah. Graduation yeah. isn't a for sure thing anymore. Right. Walking down and walking across the stage and getting my diploma isn't for sure. Um, you, you know, being immune from wildfires in California isn't a reality anymore. Yeah. And so these kids are just being brought up in this world where certainty is no longer certain. And it's causing them to adapt and be reflective and say, well, what's the clarity? If we can't have certainty, what's the clarity? Um, and as we move forward, we, we look to these kids and what they're prototyping and what they're doing um, really as sources of inspiration because of that. Mm -hmm. Well, and in some, you know, thinking about our own context, you know, Bob and I, we started playing around and talking about what things could the church learn from the future and where could we be adaptive. And I remember talking about early on how the church will have to think about ways of gathering and doing things that cross over those two realities. How do we, how do, we do things that we're doing in person, but maybe it involves wider communities of people or other folks who might not normally come but can have access and what does that look like? And, uh, you know, that has been, um, uh, let's say, a, a less than popular notion about how church will be <laughs> until yeah. about a month ago. And all of a sudden, yeah. we see people beginning to experience this kind of cross reality and reflect it back to us of, wow, we were doing this, but we're doing this, and people are doing this with me, and they're not here. And, then, and they begin to have some sense of that. And so I'm curious, as you are looking at uh, from your more future uh, vantage point, which I, I really do think you all have, but you're looking at organizations kind of adapt in this moment, where do you see sparks of things like that taking off where you can say, oh, wow, 
I, I can see in that organization over there, which could be anything from education to a tech thing to pharmaceuticals, but you see a, a generational shift where all of a sudden uh, an older generation gets a sense of what, you know, the 15 year old's been swimming in, right? I mean, they <laughs> swim in that constantly. And they were doing that before a month ago, right? Yep. So do you see some of that? Do you see some sparks kind of popping? Oh, up yeah. Yeah, I, th I think you're right. There's, there's sparks, uh, sparks all around. And the question is, where do the, where do the flames?